we're moving into the area of textual critical analysis. And uh, as we go through this process, one thing I asked you to do for today was to bring Scott with you, a simplified guide to BHS. Please bring this to every class while we're dealing with textual analysis, textual critical analysis. We will be referring to it, we will use it, we will reference it, and we'll be opening it together at many times to make certain that you properly use it and that you know how to use it. Uh, if you have the fourth edition, that is fine. If you have the third edition, that is fine. The only difference between the third and fourth editions is that the third edition includes a Latin vocabulary. And that will prove of help to you as you move into the text. But if you have one of the more recent editions of BHS, you have the Latin vocabulary inside it toward the end of the preface. And there's a series of prefaces, including the prolegomena that gives the uh, symbols and signs. And then it has the abbreviations for the Masora Parva. And uh, then it has an uh, English and German key to the Latin. And so if you have the fourth edition of this on, the, on Scott, it does not have that, but you have it inside your volume of BHS. If you're using an older copy of BHS, then you need to have that uh, list, and that list is found in the third edition of Scott. So either way, it's available, but you will be using it, and you will need to use it. Now, in addition, in the syllabus, in the course notes, I have included a lot of information for you on text critical analysis. Those notes begin on page 111 in the study notes. And uh, there, is a num there are a number of Latin terms that I've defined for you in English. And there are symbols I've provided for you in English, as well as an explanation of the nomenclature for the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, all of that is available for you right there in the syllabus from pages 111 to 114. In addition, in the syllabus starting on page 116 and going to page 117 is the template for paper number three's content. Paper number three will still have a formal thesis title page. It will still have a translation page, further revising your translation. But the body of your paper will be two tables. One table for the Masora Parva that you were assigned when you submitted your request for a text, your choice of text. When I returned that to you, I gave you the assignment for the Masora Parva and for the textual crit critical apparatus for you specifically on your specific text. If you have lost that, if you have not downloaded it, if you have in some fashion misplaced it, erased it from your disk or whatever, please let me know. I can resend that to you because I have copies of that and can make certain you get it. But your, the body of tech, uh, paper number three is a table on Masora Parva arranged just exactly the way it's arranged on page 116. It'll, it may take more than a half a page. It may take a page, it may take a page and a half for your assignment. And then a table for the text critical apparatus that you see on page 117. That is the content of what you're asked to do for the text critical analysis paper, paper number three. So the format is there, the sample, the template is there for you. Follow it and you will not have any problems. Now my task starting today is to explain to you the meaning of those various pieces of information in the Masora Parva, uh, the pieces of information in the text critical apparatus, and how to access them, how to interpret them, and how to record them. So as we begin today, we're going to be talking about, first of all, the page of Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensis. You can see it here on the screen for Joshua chapter 21. And as you're looking at that, please note 
that uh, this is exact reproduction of what you will find if you open a hard copy of Biblia Hebraica Stuttgart Tensis on page 391. You'll notice that the text itself is in the box of green. That is the Hebrew text. And outside of that, you have at the bottom one small line or sometimes two or three lines that each entry normally begins with a capital M and lowercase m and that stands for Masora Magna or the Greater Masora. The Greater Masora. I'll be explaining what that is for in a few minutes. At the bottom of the page where you see the purple box down there or blue box depending on how it shows up for you is the textual critical apparatus, or as I've abbreviated it for you on your assignment, on your choice of text, the TCA, Textual Critical Apparatus. This is keyed to the body of the text by means of superscript letters, and it is arranged verse by verse. We'll be looking at that and talking about it and interpreting it. In the center of the text, you'll see there some smaller font verses. Those are added text that were inserted by the editors and they were put in small print in order to let us know that this is not the way they received the text. And when we're talking about Old Testament studies as compared to New Testament studies, Old Testament textual criticism as compared to New Testament criticism, when you open up a critical edition of the Greek New Testament, the editors have made their choices of selections, their decisions with regarding the readings of the text. And they have inserted their opinions into the body of the text itself and then offered support and explanation in the textual critical apparatus. In the Hebrew tradition, the editors of a Hebrew Bible do not alter the text except on very rare occasions, only about two or three times in the entire Old Testament. And this is one of them. But normally, we, if we are disagreeing with the text the way we received it, we do not alter that text to produce a new textual edition. We give a note in the textual critical apparatus of the text that explains the support for a different reading. But we do not take that different reading and put it in the text. We pass the text on exactly as we received it. In Old Testament studies, the rule of thumb is do not mess with the text. All right? Do not produce your version of the Hebrew text like they do in the New Testament. New Testament texture critics play fast and free with the text, feeling free to change it at will, alter it, and just offer you explanations for their readings in the footnotes. Sometimes they'll even alter it to such an extent that they will need to classify it and say this is a C reading, which means it is of considerable doubt, but we're going to give it to you anyway. We're going to select it anyway. And they'll even sometimes go so far as to put that reading in square brackets within the text to further identify that not only is this of grave doubt that it should be read this way, but it's grave doubt with great reservation. But they'll still alter the text and do it anyway. You'll see that in the United Bible Society's text just sometimes turn to the Gospel of Luke and take a look, I believe in chapter 11 or 12, where we have about the 70 or the 72 that are sent out by Christ. Are there 70 or are there 72? The United Bible Society's text puts the number 2 in square brackets and gives it a C rating. So they're indicating that it's with grave doubt and great reservation that it should be read 72, but they're going to make it read that way anyway. We do not do that kind of thing in the Old Testament. So you might ask, well then, what is the purpose of this added text here then? If, if the Hebrew text authors very seldom do this, why do it here? That's because of the fact that when you read through this text in chapter 21 is a list of cities that have been conquered and the kings that have been conquered. When you get to the end of the text, you find that there is a summary total given of the kings and the cities. Without those two verses, the totals do not work out. Not only that, 
But the Stuttgart text is following that of Codex Leningradensis B19A that was found in the library in Leningrad, Russia. And the editors, looking at that one manuscript, realize it is the only Hebrew manuscript of Joshua chapter 21 in existence that omits those two verses. And not only that, they can see immediately by by comparing the beginning and ending of it, that is a matter of homeoteletron, uh, uh, similar endings, or homeoarchton, similar beginnings, that has created this error by the scribe of one manuscript, Leningradensis B19a. All of the major versions, the Greek Septuagint, the Syriac Peshitta, the Latin Vulgate, all include the text that is missing here. You say, well, then why not just go ahead and put it in in regular type if it's so very certain? Because, as I told you, in Old Testament studies, we don't mess with the text. We let you know what condition the text was when we received it. And that's why they're putting it in small print. They're saying, we did not receive it with these two verses inserted. We received it without them. But we are so very convinced that they belong here, we're going to put them in. But because we are fearful in our reverence for the text to mess with it, we're going to make certain you understand that we are the ones who inserted it, just in case we are wrong. There is a certain amount of humility that is found in Old Testament textual critics as opposed to New Testament textual critics. <laughs> right? And uh, I appreciate that. It's one of the reasons why I love Old Testament studies. You don't have that arrogance of saying, you've got to read the text the way I believe it reads. No, in our field, that has no importance at all. What's important is in what condition did we receive this text? What did it say when we received it? And that is all important. The text and nothing but the text. Thank you. On the outside margins of your pages, in Biblia Hebraica Stuttgart Tensus, where I have this red box, we have the Masora Parva. That's the abbreviation, the capital M and lowercase p, in your choice of text, paper, when I returned it to you, with the assignment that I gave you. It tells you what Masora Parva you are to deal with in paper number three. That is the lesser Masora. Masora. You see, these down here are the major Masora the greater Masora. This is the lesser Masora. Now it's called greater and lesser because the greater is actually a reference. The numbers, when you have down here, uh, MM 1361, or whatever that is, I can't see it too, too well on the screen. Uh, yes, 1361. That is a table number where the Masoretes collected all of the references in the Hebrew Bible that are exemplified by the form that is thus noted in the text. So it's like a concordance of occurrences. And you go to list number 1361 in the Masora Hagad, ha, Hamasora Hagadolah, and then you look up that list and it will list all the references for you. Uh, if it says here that this particular form is found nine times, it will tell you the nine places to find it. So it's a huge uh, set of volumes. It is a table of references, and therefore it's called the Greater Masora. It takes up a lot more space and room to publish it as compared to just publishing the Masora Parva in the margins, which is nothing more than a list of abbreviations giving notes about readings in the text. Yes, sir. Um, when you said similar forms, do you mean the exact words or similar grammar? We will explain that. Okay. It differs okay. from one place to the other. Okay. All right, yes? So who, who wrote these? The Masoretes. The Masoretes produced all of this. They added the, he, they added the vowel pointings to the text, the accents to the text, and they produced the Masora Parva, and they produced the Masora Magna and all of its lists. Remember, this was done in the age when there were no such things as computers. And these men studied the text and gave their life to the text in such a way that it resulted in all of this information. And why did they do it? 
there's the rub, there's the question. Why did they go to such an extent to do this? Because they wanted to protect the text from corruption. All of this was in order to preserve the text as received. To catalog every occurrence of an exact form or a similar form in order that anyone checking the text would have the tools to tell whether or not what they have before them is the correct text that it has been accurately copied and passed on. It was their reverence for the text, desiring not to change it, desiring to check every scribe's results and to make certain that a copy had met the high standards where it could be utilized in the synagogue. If it did not meet those standards, if it ran contrary to all of those lists and all of these notes, in fact, it only had to go contrary to one or two of them, and it was immediately discarded. It was not burned, it was given a burial. And that's why we have things that along the Dead Sea, where we have buried manuscripts. We'll get to that a little bit later. So that gives you the layout. Gentlemen, be certain you can identify this because this will be one of the major parts of the final exam at the end of this year. Yes, sir? Are these slides available for us? They will be posted okay. as course documents. Okay. All right, any other questions on this? Yeah. Yes, sir? Um, on the Logos version, I have the apparatus version. Obviously, it doesn't give the boxes. But it has the... Uh, well, the boxes are my drawing on there to show you. No, I realize that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but the Lagos version does not give you a textual critical apparatus at the bottom of the page, does not give them a sore part, correct? Right. And that's why you need to look at a printed copy to do your assignment for paper number three. You will not be able to do your assignment unless you use a printed copy. If you do not own a printed copy, shame on you, you should. All right? It's been required of you now for three semesters. This is the third semester in which a hard copy is required. And uh, if for some reason you do not have that available to you, you need to photocopy the pages and have those available so that you can do this assignment because you cannot do paper number three without looking at a hard copy. There is no electronic edition that will give you the information that you need. So you will have to use a hard copy. Yes, sir? Why is it that we don't just have an edition that translates this stuff into English? Uh, there will be an edition that translates it into English with a lot of abbreviations because they cannot give it fulsomely and take too much space. But the English edition is going to be BHQ, Biblia Hebraica Quinta. We'll talk to you about that uh, a little bit later. Okay? But I would be surprised if your grandchildren get to see it in its final completed form. It's taking a long, long time to get published. I know my grandchildren might not see it, and I know that I will not see it, unless something really drastic happens to speed up the whole process. All right, let's take a close look at the Masora Parva. Up at the top here, you will see a Zion with a dot over it, then a dot on the line like a period, looks like a diamond, a Kaf with a dot over it, a chaith with a dot over it, and then you have baith, ayin, yod, and noon, and the noon has a dot over it. Now let's explain this. When you go into the text itself, you will find that over the top of the text are little like degree markers, a little circle. We call it a circellus or a circule. It is a little, get the, my pointer here out, it is that little marker right there between the first and second words of the top line of the page and another one between the second and third words and then there's another one over the F at the end of the line. Now the way you identify these is where the circule is placed. If as in those first three words the circules are between the words that means that the reading is all one reading and all three words must be kept together and then when you start with the circule on the right and you have there two of them together between then the reading for that is the first reading on the right hand side in the margin the Zion with a dot over it. The dot on the line divides that 
from the next circule or set of circles. So the last part is the circle over the F at the top. So as you're looking at this, you go from your text here, you, you look at that circle there, you see it's between words, so that means these two words are to be kept together. You go and you have another circle between words, which means then all three of these words are one reading. They are to be kept together as one, and therefore the first reading in the margin, here it's not blown up, over here I've blown it up so you can see it more easily, is the Zion. And so that Zion with a dot over it refers to those three words exactly the way they are in the text. No changes, alterations, or differences allowed. Then the dot, the, the circle over the top of the F, it's centered on the word, has only to do with that one word. And that is the last circle in that line. And so it is this reading, the kaf with a dot, the chaith with a dot, and then the baith, ayin, yod, nun with a dot. Everyone got that so far? So watch for the circles. Look for the little degree marks. If they're over a word, that has to do with that one word. If they're between the words, it ties the words together and you continue to tie them together until you have a space without a circle. And then that phrase is ended. You begin as you do on the right hand. Hebrew reads right to left. You read from right to left here. This first one is the first grouping. The second one is the last circle. What do we have here in the text? Well, we have a mixture. We have symbols for numbers. And we have Aramaic words that are abbreviated. When we put a uh, Zion with a dot over it, that is a number. Look at the back of Scott. What is the value of a Zion with a dot over it? The table is on the back. Okay, that's right. You've got it there. It has a value of seven. Seven. Now notice that's all by itself. So what does that say? It says that that grouping of those exact same three words together occurs seven times in the Hebrew Bible. Seven times in the Hebrew Bible. Not seven times in the book of Joshua, although it might be true. Not seven times in the historical books. But when it's not identified as the range, you assume it means in the Hebrew Bible. Okay, so those three words tied together by those two circles that are between the words, those three words occur just like that seven times in the Hebrew Bible. Then we come to the last circle, the F. And over the top of the F you have the circle. It deals only with the F, not with the word that is tied to with the makaf. If the word that is tied to with makaf should be included, in other words, if it should be F, Ta, and Nak, the circle would be over the makaf. It would be between the two words. It's over only the F, so it has only to do with the F. So when in your table you place what Hebrew word we're talking about, you only put F and nothing else. All right? And you have a Kaf and a Chaf, both with a dot over it, which means those are numbers. So go to the back. What is the value of kaf? 20. What's the value of chaith? Not 9. 8. So 20 plus 8 equals what? 28. So it says 28 times, and then you have baith, ayin, yod, nun. The baith in the Masora Parva is primarily the preposition baith. All right? So first look this up without the baith. Take Scott, turn in Scott to where you see the index of the small Masora. The index of the small Masora is alphabetically arranged by the Hebrew letters. Find Ayan Yod Nun. Ayan Yod Nun. When you have found it, raise your hand. When you found Ayan Yod Nun, raise your hand.
four of you. We need to have more. Five, six. Find it yet, gentlemen? Ayan, Yod, Noon. Keep looking. Okay? I want to see at least three more hands. All right. What page did you find it on? Page 48. The middle of the page. If, uh, if you have not found it, turn to page 48. Look at the middle of the page. Begin at the left-hand side where you have the Hebrew letters. And notice you have there, Ayin Yod Nun with a dot over it, comma. Ayin Yod Nun Yod Nun with a dot over it equals Ayin Yod Nun Yod Nun, comma. Ayin Yod Nun Yod Nun Yod Nun. Now, that is source or I, E-Y-E, Ayin but it's ain here. And so the abbreviation stands for either a neen, a context or source or section, or a neen, contexts or sources or sections. The reason you have een on the end instead of im is because this is Aramaic. These are Aramaic words, Aramaic uh, endings, Aramaic grammar. All right? And so that tells you then that we read this with the baith meaning what? What's baith mean? In. So this means that eth occurs 28 times in the context or in the section. What section are we talking about? Joshua chapter 21. So what happens if a scribe produces a text of Joshua and when the one who is examining the text gets to Joshua chapter 21 and finds 29 Fs? It's the gong show. <laughs> All right, the gong rings and uh, his pay is docked and his manuscript cannot be used. What if he has 27? Same thing disapproved, disqualified, unusable. You see, they did this in order to preserve the text. It gave them cross checks for the text. When I was working in Bangladesh on the Tipra translation, uh, they sent the text to me and they said, can you find a way for us to check to see if this translation is accurate in what we've done? And I devised a series of universal computer searches for words, for forms, and for phrases that would allow us to search the uh, computer files to locate every identical occurrence of that phrase. And then we'd compare it against various concordances to find out whether or not we had missed something or whether something had not been translated the same way. We tested it like even spelling the name Jerusalem. We looked to see how many times Jerusalem occurs in the entire New Testament. And we put it in with the spelling utilized in the Tipra language into the computer base and out came the number of times, the number of hits for it. We compared it to the concordance that told us how many times Jerusalem occurred in the New Testament. And if we found that there were five or six missing, then we went searching verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, until we found the ones that were missing. Usually it was a typographical error and we would make the correction of the spelling until we did a universal search, a global search, and came up with the exact number of hits we ought to come up with. We did that consistently. We did that over a period of a year and a half. And that is what the Masoretes are doing here but they didn't have computers to do it. They had to do it manually, visually, with their fingers and their eyes going through the manuscript and going through the, the list that had been prepared. And if they found, you know what happened? If they found a mistake that was not cataloged in the list, they started a new list. Every time you have a Masora Parva note in the margin, it tells you that somewhere along the way, the Masoretes discovered that scribes made mistakes at that point. And these are the cataloging of all the places where mistakes were made. And they were the alert, saying basically, 
In the past, we have learned through sad experience that scribes often make a mistake at this exact word. You, the scribe who are now copying the text, make certain you do not do the same. It's a warning to you. It also tells you that the text thus marked was considered by them to be the text and ought not to be altered in any way. It must be conveyed exactly this way in all such occurrences listed in their lists. The preservation of the text. When you see this, when you understand it, it is something that is glorious to behold. It ought to be a challenge to us to be equally intense about the preservation of the text. Having a high regard for it, a high respect for it. This is the purpose of all this in the margin. Yes, sir. Um, when you said this section of the context that's, that was, that's being referred to in this example is um, uh, Joshua 21. Correct. Um, I, I, I can't remember now. I know the verse numbers were put in quite late. But Correct. So the chapter, the chapter breaks were put in before or around the time of the Masoretes? The Masoretes were put in the section breaks, the Pays and the Psalmics, to deal with section breaks or paragraph breaks. Uh, they, before the mass reads, they weren't there, but they marked off the sections by means of recognizing the structure of sections and looking at the literary analysis and understanding how it all fits together. Joshua chapter 21 is a very easy one to see as a section that's coherent because, as I said, it's a list and it has totals at the end of it. And so here it's very obvious, even if we had no markings at all, it would be obvious to anyone that whatever we now call Joshua chapter 21, verses 1 through whatever, even before there were verse numbers and chapter numbers, the text and context were very clearly understood. All right? Anyone else? Yes, sir. So just to clarify, to so understand, the reason they picked the, the F there was because of the previous mistakes in the past. That's right. And that's why they chose that word. And so anytime we see a word like that, it alerts us that this could be a potential for us to make a mistake. It, it lets us know that in the past it was a mistake. And it was to alert the scribes who were copying the text of areas of potential mistakes. Okay? It's not alerting us to a mistake in the text today. Okay? But it's telling us in the past they observed that mistakes were made there. Yes, sir. So in each in that section, each F will have the same notation. It will. Each F will have the same notation. All twenty-eight. Yes, sir. Can you remind me the name of that degree symbol? Circule. Circule. I'll put it up here on the board. It's C I R C U L E. In the Latin, it's circellus. And you'll often see it written this way, C-I-R-C-E-L-L-U-S. In English, we just use circule rather than the Latin circellus. Some would pronounce the uh, Latin curculus. It's where we get the word circle from. Okay. Right? So watch for that. That leads you to where you want to go. Now, gentlemen, why do we take time to learn these uh, Masora Parva? Let me give you testimonies. First of all, let me give you my own testimony. When I went to my doctoral program at Grace Theological Seminary, I had a professor by the name of Dr. Donald Fowler. And I can remember that as we were translating the book of Amos one semester and doing it in Hebrew exegesis, as we would read around the room and he'd ask for comments, I constantly was looking at the Masora Parva, and when questions were asked about different words, I would just say, this word is only found so many times in the Hebrew Bible, or this word, or this phrase, are found so many times in the uh, context, or in the book of Joshua, or whatever. And finally, one day, he stopped the class after I made a comment like that, and he said, Mr. Barrick, do you have a photographic memory? And I said, no, sir. And he says, well, you're always commenting about this occurs so many times, this occurs so many times, this occurs spelled this way so many times, and this way so many times, and this occurs so many times in these books except for once or twice, and you always give these exact figures. Where do you come up with these things? Are you just making them up? <laughs> I said, no, sir, I'm not making them up. They're right here in the text. I said, I'm just, I'm just reading what the text says. And he said, show me. And I showed him. 
He dismissed the class. He says, Mr. Barrick's staying. He says, the rest of you can go. He said, please teach me. No one has ever taught me this before. And he said, I can see this is a tremendous tool to have to be able to talk about some of these words and phrases this way and to understand what we have in the margins. And he said to understand that this is to protect and preserve the text because I explained to him why I paid attention to it. You see, before I went for my doctorate, I taught for six years. And during that time, I taught my students these things too. They were things I taught myself in seminary because I was never taught it in seminary. And I'm the kind of person that if I have a Hebrew Bible and it has all the stuff all over the page, I'm going to find out what it's all about. And so even though my professors did not teach me, I taught myself. I found the books. I found the material necessary. I read the prefaces to give all the information because the prefaces include all this information. They interpret it all. They tell you all about it. And I like reading the prefaces of books and the introductions. Whether it's a Bible translation or anything, I read those introductions. Because the writers have given it to us, the editors have given it to us for a purpose. To help us be able to better understand what they've done and to better use that material. And so I did that. And that helped out immensely. And let me tell you, in that class from that point on, I had it easy. <laughs> it was amazing. It was a great time. Uh, let me give you a second testimony. This was, I believe, uh, Mark Zakovich who uh, sent this testimony to me, or his brother Joe. I think it was Mark, though. Mark went from here, after he finished his THM, went to Hebrew University in Jerusalem for schooling. And when he was there, he sat in a class with about 20-some other students, all of them Israelis. He was the only foreigner. He was American. All but one of those Israelis spoke uh, modern Hebrew fluently, one was still learning. He had evidently been an immigrant from elsewhere and just become a is Israel citizen. And then there was Mark. And in class, the professor began talking about the text. And as things progressed, Mark was interacting with the professor about what the Masora Parva said in the margin. The professor stopped the class and said, Mr. Zakovich, where did you learn this? Aren't you an American? Yes, sir, I'm an American. He turned to the class and he says, how many of you Israelis speaking modern Hebrew understand and can read the Masora Parva? One hand went up. The professor said, all right, you two are my favorite pupils from now on. <laughs> and he told Mark, he said, I want to know why it is that you learned this. And Mark told him, my professor at the Master's Seminary required this of third semester Hebrew students. We were required to learn this. We turned in a paper that read the text that we were working with with regard to Masora Parva. And that professor said, you had a very good teacher in education. Now, you see, gentlemen, you never know when you might need this. You might be witnessing to a Jew. And the very fact you pay attention to the marginal readings, the marginal notes, can impress them and give them enough confidence in you to listen to you as you give the gospel. You might be like Mark and go to Hebrew University or some other university where a professor is going to be very pleased that you're one of his very few students who can read it. But above and beyond that, just having that knowledge and being able to access it should be reward enough. All right? So that's why we're covering it. We cover it because it helps us to better understand the text, to appreciate its history and its preservation at the hands of the Masoretes. When you finish a study like this, you come away, you do not have the attitude that you don't trust the Masoretes. Instead, you stand before them in awe of the immense amount of work they did just out of a pure desire and drive to maintain the purity of the text. And that is something we can all appreciate and follow up with. Let's go further here. When along the text you find a lamed with a dot over it, it does not mean a number. Look at the back what does the Lamed as a number mean? 
it means 30. It will only be used in combination with other numbers. You'll have a Lamed Aleph with a dot over each meaning 31. You'll have a Lamed Chaith with a dot over each meaning 38. But you will never have the number 30 written as a Lamed by itself. Never, ever, ever. Instead, it will be written as a Kaf Yod or a Yod Kaf. 10 plus 20 or 20 plus 10 equals 30. 30 will never be written with the Lamed. Go to your uh, list again of the Masora Parva and find the Lamed with a dot over it, just like you found the Ayan Yod Noon with a dot over it. When you find it, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, Ten. Turn to page 42. Page 42, about a third of the way down, you see a Lamed by itself that says sign of the dative case. That does not have a dot over it. All right? It's just a Lamed preposition. But look at the next one down. That one, and in this particular edition, they omitted the dot over it. It should be. It's a printing error. You can add it in with your pen. And it equals late. The Aramaic word late. What does late mean? Anyone read it? What does it mean? There is no other. This word or combination of words does not occur except in this place. It has the effect of meaning once or unique. All right? So anytime you see a Lamed, that means that is the only occurrence in the text of that particular word word or form. And as you look at this, you have to go up here. Okay, we're right there at that Lamed. So it's going to be the Lamed is right. It's the last circle and it's right there. Above Ba'ishtara. 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 That circle above Ba'ishtara tells you that Ba'ishtara occurs only there in the entire Hebrew Bible. Yes, sir. Something occurs in the whole Hebrew Bible, and then one time you said it occurs just in this section. Right, and notice that the Masora Parva will tell you that. You don't have to guess. Right. It tells you that. So which ones were those? The very first one we looked at was the Zion up there at the top, the entire Hebrew Bible. The second we looked at said in this section, right up there at the top, the upper left. All right, and then we looked at this one, and this one means in the entire Hebrew Bible. Okay. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, the definition says that this word or combination of words, so that means that word doesn't occur without the day. Just notice that the circle is only over the eshtera, not over the weef. Okay. If it referred to the weef plus that word the circle would be over the makaif halfway between them. So it only refers to ba'eshtara. So what combinations of words like? Well, if it was, if it was between uh -huh. the two, that would be a combination. Oh. Okay? In other words, if you have more than one word, is a combination. Oh. Yeah. All right? Yeah. And, there, and we, remember, we looked at a combination at the very top of the page. Three words that occur together. That's a combination. Okay. Yes, sir. So, then this uh, follow up question to that is it the word in the form as we see it there? or Absolutely. Okay. So you do not alter it. In other words, you can't say eshtara. You have to say ba'eshtara. It has to include the base preposition. It is this form exactly as given there, not a part of it, but that form. Okay, good question. Anyone else? Oh, the root word might occur many other places. But this particular form with the base preposition with these vowel pointings will not occur anywhere else. Okay? Yes, sir? Accents or... Yes, it does. And when it takes into account accents, they will tell you so. Okay? Yes, sir? 
this, this is really going to sound dumb, but no question is dumb. <laughs> Alright, so it, only, it it occurs nowhere else like this. So is the can you explain like how, how that means something? Like what is, what is the significance of that? I'm not, I'm not connected. It means when you're interpreting this text, you're exegeting the text, and you would like to find out if this word or its form or this phrase is found anywhere else in Scripture where you might be able to go and check what, how it's used there. That if it's found only here, there is no other place to go. You can stop searching. Okay, so if I, that mark will let me know that there's nowhere else for me to basically... Compare to see how this That's is exactly right. right, because it occurs only one time. If it occurs, if it says, like up there, that it occurs uh, seven times, then you say, okay, I've got seven places I need to look to find these first three words up there in the text at the upper right that I can compare their context with this context and find out what the meaning of that is. When you're doing your papers and you're doing your analysis, when you're doing your preaching, when you study the text, don't you use concordances for that very purpose? You're looking at something, like last night I spoke to the semwives, and we have the verb energeo used of God working in you, and how do you find out what that means? You look at energeo elsewhere in the New Testament text, and you find other similar occurrences where God or something is working in, and it helps you understand. Or when you use the uh, word there for, uh, to work out, uh, your salvation. You look up that word in the Greek and you find everywhere it's used and you find those similar contexts that help you to better understand what it means in Philippians 2.12. That's exactly what the mass reads are giving you, that type of information. And if you do that and use that for your preaching, for your study and for exegesis, then the Masora Parva are going to be of value to you. If you don't do that in your interpretation, it's of no value to you, but your teaching will also probably be of no value because you're not interested in comparing Scripture with Scripture. All right? This allows you to compare Scripture with Scripture. You, can you see the value of that? I don't think there's a single one of you that teach or preach that don't compare Scripture with Scripture, that don't check to see where the same phrase or the same words occur and try to determine then what the meaning is in the text you're preaching on. So this is one of those tools that helps you. It's as valuable as your concordance. If you don't use the Masar Parva, please go home and burn your concordances. All right? Yes, sir? It doesn't give you an indication of where those other uh, times are addressed. It just says it's going to be eight times. Sometimes it will tell you because it will put a superscript number like that that will refer to the Masora Parva, which will refer you to a list that will list all occurrences. <laughs> so you can go to the library and you can get the compilation of the Hamasora Hagedolah by Gerard Weil, and he will have them all listed for you and you can find where they are. But there's an easier way now with the computer. Your computer makes that volume unnecessary because all you have to do is click on it and search for this form. You know, not the lemma, not the root, but the form, and you'll get the same results, or you should get the same results. So if you clicked on those three words up there and you don't come up with seven hits, uh, something wrong with your computer software. And it probably is because the typist who input the data at Westminster put in part of the data in the wrong order so that the search does not get a hit because it doesn't have the right order because computers are super literal. You may look at it visually and you say it looks identically, but if the holum was typed after instead of before, then it's not going to show up in the list, in the hits. And that is computer operator error. That is an input error. Garbage in, garbage out. All right? And that's part of what they've been doing on trying to correct the Westminster database is the errors of inputting data. Notice the little arrow I put in here, the green arrow, second line up there. We have a taith with the dot over it. What does that mean? Where do you look? What does it mean? Nine times, all right? Then you have a resh, what looks like a quote, and a pay. Look it up in the list. 
find what it means. Resh, what looks like a quote mark, and a pay. Look it up in the list. Raise your hand when you find it. Okay, good. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Page 50. Right at the top of the page, second entry. Resh with the quote mark, pay equals Resh Pasuk, which means the beginning of a verse, or Resh Pesuka, the beginning of the verse, or Resh Pesukin, the beginnings of verses, or Resh Pesukin, the beginnings of verses. So it means the beginning of the verse. So what is it saying? It's saying that that, that the circle is marking, which is that the first word of verse 26, the coal up there, you'll note. I'll have to use this to show you. But that coal up there has a circle right over the middle of the word. It also has a circle to the left of the word over the makaif. Ignore that for the time being. Just pay attention to the one that's over the word. The first circle is over the word. Therefore, that means the word coal, all or every, occurs nine times at the beginning of the verse or verses, basif. Baith means what? In. What does sif with a dot over it, an abbreviation, stand for? Can you find it and tell me? Book. Sifar in the Aramaic, sefer in the Hebrew. So it means in the book. What book? Joshua. So here's an example where it tells you. So it says nine times this word kol occurs at the beginning of verses in the book of Joshua. Everyone understand that? See how clear it is? If it doesn't tell you where, you know it means in the entire Hebrew Bible. If it doesn't mean in the entire Hebrew Bible, it will tell you in this context, or in this book, or in something else it will tell you. It may even tell you in the Torah. It may tell you in the Psalms. It may tell you in the prophets. It may tell you in Esther. It may tell you in Ezekiel. But it will tell you the range. If it doesn't tell you the range, you assume it means in the entire Hebrew Bible. And that will be right about 98 to 99 percent of the time. There are some exceptions and there are exceptions that uh, uh, just show that they were men that or could be inconsistent at times. That's about it. Yes sir? In the Mazzoran part of it, it talks about book like first and second Samuel, are those considered together? First and second Samuel considered one book in the Hebrew Bible. First and second Kings, one book. First and second Chronicles, one book. The minor prophets, one book, all 12. One book. The Hebrew Bible has 22 books in it, not 39 as we have in English. 22. And so the book, reference to books will be in that fashion. Yes, sir. So a general question. In the, um, the original manuscript, the Lenin-Gradensis manuscript, yes. Is that how it was laid out on the page with the parva just on the, on the column? Yes. Sometimes the Masora parva also occurs at the top of the page and the bottom of the page. And in some of the manuscripts it occurs on both the left margin and right margin. And in manuscripts where there is a column or a space between, or like two columns and a space between columns, sometimes it occurs between the columns. In the printed editions they always put it on the outside edge of the page, never on the inside. Okay, yes sir. Just to help us understand and how to think about this, what would be the exegetical significance or any significance to the same thing I just answered the gentleman sitting next to you just a few minutes ago. You use a concordance to look up things, don't you? To find out how many times something is used, where it's used, what context it's used, determine meaning. That's the purpose of it. One of the purposes you can use it for. What else? Go ahead. I'm just thinking we're like all Maybe I'm oversimplifying it, but it seems fairly straightforward to me. Right. It's straightforward, but what it tells you is the text is guarded, protected, and put a fence around by the, by the Masoretes. And so if you pick up a commentary and they say to you, 
we believe that the text ought to have the coal removed from it at this place, you know that that's contrary to the view of the Masoretes. Because when they marked it this way and they numbered them, that's telling you that this must be kept and must be preserved. So it protects you from erroneously following a later commentator who says, I just want to amend the text because I, in my own opinion, I think it ought to be changed. Does that help? Yes, Pat? Um, if I'm correct, this started around the 7th century, is that, is that correct. right? And then went to like the 11th century? 11th to 12th century. So was there ever a revision or a commentary on the Masora part? Because we know that there were definitely mistakes because these guys were in the foul. That's right. And there are tons of revisions and tons of commentaries. And every edition of the Hebrew Bible also selects which entries they include. And sometime I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. Josh, you got a question? Okay, good. All right, let's keep moving then. So there's another example of how you read it. And then notice the second circle is over the mock cave. So what does that mean? It means coal plus the first word on the next line, arim, all the cities. So all the cities occurs three times where? In the whole Hebrew Bible. The phrase kol arim occurs three times in the entire Hebrew Bible. Notice that there is a number 14 there. And the number 14 takes you to a Masora Parva. Or a Masora Magna note. And it tells you that that is list number 1361. You go to the Masora Magna. You look at list number 1361. It will list all three of them for you. Okay. Now, in your assignment for paper number three, you are not, let me say that again, you are not to do anything with the Masora Magna. Don't include the superscript foot numbers, footnote numbers. Don't include the references in the Masora Magna. Your task is to do only the Masora Parva and the text critical apparatus, not the Masora Magna. So if you were dealing with this particular reading, you don't even record the superscript 14. Ignore it, leave it out. Your assignment does not include it. All right? Everyone understand that? For paper number three, forget about Masora Magna. Part of the reason for that is there's only one copy in the library. <laughs> and we have two sections in which students are doing the same types of assignments and we can't have a hundred students trying to get at the same one volume. So we just do not assign it. Okay. All right, let's go further. Sometimes you see a two-storied entry like you do right up here. All right. That is a Kativ Kare. The Kativ Kare, I'll write it here on the board for you. Kativ is the same as the Hebrew pas Cal passive participle katub. But in the Aramaic, it's the pa'al passive participle. It means written. That which is written. Kare is related to the Hebrew kara. It is a participle. Kare, it's a pa'al participle. And in the Hebrew, it would be kore. A cal active participle. In the Aramaic, it's kare. So it's written, that which is written, and that which is read. R-E-A-D. That which is written in the text, and that which you read. Now, the Kativ kare is always marked by that kof in a two-storied type, a two-level type of entry. That is not a number. This is an abbreviation for the, Hebrew word, for the Aramaic word kare. So it is saying that the text itself, if you go up here, you find the circule for it right here, has Golan, a Gimel, Holam, Lamed, Comets, Wow, Noon. What is unusual about that? What is unusual about that? The wow is connected with the 
comets rather than being connected with the holum. So that is unusual. So someone decided that instead you should put the wow over here with the holum. And so the revised text or reading is put here in the margin. Gimel, wow, lamed, noon. Now, let me explain something more to you. For the past probably 300 years, the concept was that the Katif Kare is a correction of the text and that there was an indication by the mass reads that here the text is corrupt and that it should be read as it is in the margin, thus the name Katif Kare. The Katif is in the text, the Kare is in the margin. All right? That's why you have the Kof under that reading, not a Kaf for Katif. It's the Kof for Kare. Let me go over that again. Notice this is a Q. That is for this letter. This is a K. That's for this letter. In the text there in the margin, you have a dot over a kof. Tells you it's the kare. So what is in the margin is that which is read. What is in the text is what is written. Now, for 300 years to 400 years, it had been assumed that the Masoretes were indicating that there was a mistake in the text and that this is the correction. In the last 50 to 80 years, Hebraists have reached a different conclusion. At least some Hebraists have. Right now, 5% of all of the world's Hebraists have changed their view on this. And they believe that now what the Masoretes were saying, and they've provided a wealth of evidence to support it, that when they put this reading in here, they are saying, you may have heard that that word, Golan, in the text itself, spelled this way, should be changed so it is spelled this way. But do not do it. In other words, that it's a warning not to change the text to what is in the margin. James Barr has reached that conclusion. A number of other men have reached that conclusion. And it's out there now and being taught and is beginning to spread. I thoroughly expect, because of the weight of the evidence for this, and because the responses from rabbis has been less than equal to the task and they've not been able to confound it or to deny it. And in fact, some have pl- produced ancient medieval rabbinic manuscripts in which it appears that the Masoretes said that exact same thing. That what they were doing is saying, those of you who look at the text and say that wow is in the wrong place and you want to change it to read this, do not do that. Preserve it as it is. You see, a comet's wow is an acceptable combination in Hebrew. We have a comet's wow at the end of words in the Hebrew where you have a third masculine singular pronominal suffix. It is a diphthong that is pronounced ow. And it is here, it would be golaun. And we do not know but what that spelling that's in the text is an archaic spelling, an original spelling, the way it was actually spelled in ancient times and accurately recorded. It is merely our modern hubris that we want to conform and make everything in the Hebrew Bible spelled according to a certain system and we want to have conformity throughout that we insist upon conforming it to the way that we pronounce it rather than to allow an ancient spelling to stand. And after all here, what difference does it make anyway? It's still the same place, by the same name, it's still Golan. It does not change anything to change the spelling. But to the Masoretes, changing spelling was still a perversion of the text. So whether they meant this to say, that this has been perverted or whether they're saying don't pervert it remains yet to be proven and seen entirely. But I expect the next 25 years that this number of uh, Hebraists that accept this theory is going to grow to at least 50% of all Hebraists. And I fully expect that within the next 50 years the minority will be those who hold to the old way of understanding it that it'll, it'll work its way to only 5% still hanging on saying this is a correction of the text. Yes, sir. Um, what 
would be your recommendation to us in terms of how the weighting we should give to the, the curry? I think that you should not give weight to the curry. It should be considered, but I am of the opinion I'm among the 5%. I believe the evidence demonstrates that, that by all the Cathif Curay, there's a wonderful work done by uh, Robert Gordas. His magnum opus is on the Cathif Curay, in which he went in and examined every single Cathif Curay in the Hebrew Bible found in all extant manuscripts cataloging them. Some manuscripts have just a little over 800 Cathif Kareis. The uh, other manuscripts go as high as 1,500 Cathif Kareis in the Hebrew Bible. He looked at every single one of them. He compared them with parallel examples throughout the text. He compared them with how the Septuagint translators translate it. He compared them in the Pentateuch with the Samaritan Pentateuch. He compared them with the Latin Vulgate. He compared them with the Aramaic Targums. And he reached the conclusion that the Khatib Kareis, in the vast majority of cases, at his time, when he first did that study, back in the 1940s and 1950s, at that time, he was the first one to mention the possibility of this viewpoint. And it was as a result of his very exhaustive and detailed analysis and comparative analysis of each and every Khatib Kareis in the Hebrew text. And that's one of the reasons why this is beginning to gain momentum. For years, everyone looked at that and said, oh, what a great work he did, and then just forgot it or didn't utilize it. But in the recent few decades, a large number of men have begun to take his work seriously and have gone back and reread that and begun to check and countercheck what he wrote and have found his material and his data to be just spotless. And it is causing people to rethink the whole situation. He even cites rabbis for some of his viewpoints. So th this type of thing, gentlemen, I think that we need to be cautious how we do it. I would not take a reading from the margin and make it what the text says. I would be very careful of that. Uh, if you do go ahead and accept a reading like that, that's fine. I mean, after all, you have 95% of the world's Hebraeus would support you in it. But be aware that perhaps before the Lord comes or before you go to be with the Lord, it might change. And uh, you might find yourself on the outside. Josh. Are there any really significant texts that, you know, would add fuel to this kind of... Absolutely. Genesis 49, verse 10, on the word Shiloh. Hmm. The Masora Parva there and the so-called Kethiv Karei there indicates that we should not change it to mean to whom it belongs, but should retain it as a proper name, Shiloh. Those liberal theologians who for years have argued it should be changed to to whom it belongs, and the translations, the modern translations that have gone to to whom, whom it belongs, instead of reading Shiloh, are actually in error. They even misread the Masora Parva in their viewpoints. And the Masora Parva have been altered by some of the Jewish community to support the liberal opinion because to them that was a way to deny the Christian interpretation of Shiloh as a reference to the Messiah in Genesis 49 verse 10. So there's also this mixed evidence you have out there where you have Jewish scholars combating Christianity and their messianic views also altering the Masora Parva of the ancient Masoretes in order to support their view and publishing editions with their altered form of the Masora Parva. Oh yes, they will admit it. In some of the publications they will admit it. They admit that the reason they made this change is to deny the Christians this text as a proof text for the Messiah. And Alfred Adersheim is one of the men that helped catalog some of those rabbi statements and those admissions. And they show up in the indexes, the final vi the appendices of uh, the, uh, what's it called? The, the Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah by Alfred Adersheim. So there's a lot of things there, gentlemen, you need to pay attention to. They do have an effect. 
And uh, one of the things that's pointed out, even by some Jewish rabbis, is that the word in Genesis 49.10 is spelled identically in every case where the proper name Shiloh is found elsewhere in the text. So why make Genesis 49.10 the only place in all the Old Testament, all the Hebrew Bible, where you make that change and make it mean to whom it belongs? It is the anti-Messianic movement. That's all it is. No one else in their right mind, understanding Hebrew, would mess with the text that way except those who are opposed and want to, opposed to taking that of the Messiah and wanting to remove it as a proof text from Christian hands. So, you know, there are many such things. And we'll talk about more of them as we go along. But uh, as you're approaching the text, I would warn you about being quick to change to make the reading what's in the margin. And that is one case where there's a major doctrinal and theological issue is in Genesis 49.10. And it's an amazing history about what's happened to it over the centuries and what's been done with that Masora Parva note. All right, now, let's take another one on this page. This one, let's see, do I have an arrow on there? It takes us where that is. Yes, we do. Right there. Okay. It's right up here where we have a dot here, which means there's two circles that have readings. We have a circle here between words. We have a circle here between words. A circle here between words. Therefore, those three are the first circle with the Zion and dot over it. Okay? The next one is a circle which, see, is there two of them there or just one? I have to see this on here. Uh, just one between. Okay? So here we have a circle right here between these two words. So you keep those two words together. The first three words up there, seven times, they're the same words we had at the top. And then we have three times that we have this. Umamete naphtali. And it's uh, in the tribe or among the tribe of uh, naphtali. And it says three times. What's the baith mean? In or with. It can mean with. In this case, it's going to be with instead of in. Because taith ayin as an abbreviation, if you look it up in the simplified guide, I'll get it here and tell you the page number to turn to. The uh, taith ayin on page 41, page 41, top of the page, fourth entry down. Taith ayin stands for ta'am, which also can be te'amin. That means accent or accents. All right? So it is saying that those two words occur three times with that accent, ba'ain. What do we find that meant? In the context. All right? So there's a case where it tells you that the accent plays a part in it as well. All right. There is a fantastic book available in the library. It's by Kelly, Minot, and Richards. It's the Masora Parva of the Hebrew Bible, of the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensis. Uh, I believe it's published by Baker. Uh, you have the uh, reference to it on page 115. Let's see, is it there? Did I put it there? No, I didn't put it there. I must have put it back in the other bibliography. That was just on textual criticism. So Kelly, Minot, and Richards. It is on page... Wait a minute. What's going on here? Not there either. There should be a reference in here somewhere to Kelly, Minot, and Richards. Well, there we go. It's on the bottom of page 116. Footnote 128. Not Richards, Crawford. Uh, Kelly, Minot, and Crawford. The Masora of Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia. Introduction and Annotated Glossary. Published by Erdmans in 1998. This is a page right out of that book. If you are going to teach Hebrew, you should own this book. Because it has a full cataloging and full explanation of the Masora Parva. 
it has an entry like this. Kof dot yod dot. That's 20 plus 10 is 30. 30. It tells you here that the lamed with the dot over it is the regular sim symbol for a hapax legomenon. And it gives you an example down here in Deuteronomy 32.51. And it tells you 30 times mul. Mul means fully written. Wello, wellate, wellate means and one time only, betora, in the Torah. So they walk you through and they show you this right here. And what it is, is in Deuteronomy 32 verse 51, we have the word oti, oti. Notice oti is a, a direct object marker plus a first common singular pronominal suffix. The holam wow is fully written in Deuteronomy 32.51. There, the note there, the Masor Parva says that oti occurs 30 times fully written like this. Oti, with the first common singular pronominal suffix, is fully written with a holam wow and one time or but one time only in the entire Torah. In other words, Deuteronomy 32.51 is the only time we have this usage of oti in the five books of Moses. But it occurs 29 other times in the Hebrew Bible where it's fully written. Okay? So that's part of that note and helps you see that. And notice the meaning of maim lamed is from the Hebrew male, to be full, fully written. Let's go to another one. You'll see this quite often, the main, maim noon hay. As abbreviation, it's an abbreviation for minhon. Minhon means of them or from them. So we look at 1 Kings 9.9 9, where we have a word evotam, which means their fathers. Avot, fathers, the am ending, third masculine plural pronominal suffix, their fathers. And we have a Masora Parva note that begins with a hey with a dot over it, which means five times. Cheth and Samic with a dot, which is from a word that means to lack. And so it's talking about it lacks full. It's the opposite of full spelling is a, what we call a defective spelling, which means it's not full. So oti, if you only had the holum and not a holum wow, that would be defective. That would be lacking the vowel letter, the full vowel. And so five times evotam is found lacking. You see here, you have a holum without a holum wow. It is a feminine plural ending. Feminine plural endings are normally a holum wow and a tau. Here it's written with only the holum. So it's defective or lacking. Not defective in the sense of an error, but it is a shortening. It's a lacking form without that full letter vowel. And so five times it is found defectively spelled or sh spelled with the short, shorter vowel in the Hebrew Bible. Okay? And then three times, and then of them, okay, come on now. Oops, I've went down too far. Okay. And three of them, because mana means of them. So five times in the Hebrew Bible, this word, evotam, that exact word, is found defectively written just as in 1 Kings 9.9. 9. Three of those five are in the prophets, and every such occurrence in the Torah Dakot, Dakot means like, is like them. And when you have the baith maim this way with dots over it, and then this can be an aleph, a baith, a gimel, a daleth, a hay, or whatever. But when you have the baith and maim together that way, that means except, E-X-C-E-P-T, except two times. How do you find that out? Take your Scott again. Look up the baith and maim. Look up the baith and maim. Scott, page 38. Scott, page 38. Page 38, two-thirds the way down the page. Page 38, two-thirds the way down the page. Notice the baith dot, maim dot, and it should have a space between them. This is a typing error of the, uh, of the editors here. Before the equal, between the baith and maim. Because they've got the baith and maim side by side. The baith and maim should be separated just like up here. 
a space between them. All right? You will not see them put side by side the way it is in here. You'll only see them this way. Baith space meme. And then a space before the number. And it means accept. It stands for barmin in the Aramaic, meaning accept, E-X-C-E-P-T. So anywhere you see that, that is, those are not numbers. This means the word accept, and the third letter is the number. Accept twice. Everyone understand that? All right. This is to help you. So that as you're going through and doing your exercise, you've at least heard some of the possibilities of what there is and where to go to find the information. You have the information in your hand in Scott. And in case you lose Scott or don't have it with you, in the front of your Hebrew Bible, after the listing of the symbols for the textual critical apparatus, you have the index siglorum et abbreviationem Masorai Parvi, the index to the Masora Parvi. And it tells you all of the Aramaic abbreviations and gives you the meaning. There's only one problem. The meanings are given in Latin. <laughs> so if you don't read Latin, it's not going to help you much. But thankfully, Latin is pretty easy to guess at most of the time. All right? So, down here, Exodus 5.16, what do we have? We have a note on Nitan. Nitan. The, the matter has to do with the comets in Nitan. 21 times Nitan occurs in the Hebrew Bible. Four of them have the comets. Kof, Beim, dot over it is an abbreviation for comets. Look it up in Scott. It's there. All right, so 21 times Nithon occurs in the Hebrew Bible. Four of those 21 use a comets under the Tau. Okay? The others use a patak, another A class vowel. Matt? Good question. You said 21 times it, it occurs in the Hebrew Bible, and then you went back to four. Is that how we are to interpret that when we see the, the numbers together and then a space? You said 21 times it occurs in the Hebrew Bible, I think is what you said. Yeah, when you have a space here, these are two different numbers. Yes. 21 so times. Okay. Then. Four of them. Take this together. Four of them. Okay. All right. Okay? This of them tells you. Okay. Okay? It means minhon up here at the top. All right? Okay. You already saw this one. The bath. With teth, ayin, meaning with this accent. All right? We have a note on Genesis 1 6 for Wa Yomer Elohim. 25 times you have Wa Yomer Elohim in the Hebrew Bible. Three of them with this accent in this context. So in Genesis 1 1 through 2 3, which would be the section in the Hebrew Bible. We have three of the 25 occurrences of Wayomer Elohim with the particular accent that is on it. The Yativ, Munak, and Zakef. Now, let's do a quick beginning here on uh, text critical apparatus. Let's take that Kativ Kare on Golan and let's do some checking, shall we? Let's do the text critical analysis using the text critical apparatus. We have it, we've already seen the Kativ Kare, right? We've talked about that. So let's go down to the text critical apparatus. Notice that you take the superscript A right here after Golan, and that tells you in the text critical apparatus below, find the verse number. This is in verse 25, uh, excuse me, not verse 25, 27. In verse 27, there's the beginning of verse 28, and verse 27 began up here. And this A, under verse 27, A, then has this information in the text critical apparatus. As we look at that text critical apparatus, we can interpret it very easily and quickly. That C <laughs> is a Gothic C. It's a Gothic C. 
It is a backward seven inside a rocker is a Gothic C. It stands for Cairo Geniza Fragment. MLT, MSS, keep these together. MLT is multi in Latin. Multi means many. Turn in your syllabus. You can also turn in the front of your Hebrew Bible in the preface and you'll see the same thing. But if, the, if you're in the syllabus on page 113 and 114 under MS, it's on 113. 113, the third entry, MLT, MSS equals many, meaning more than 20 medieval Hebrew manuscripts. But it will equal 16 to 60 medieval manuscripts in the book of Samuel. Okay, so what does this mean? It means that the Cairo Geniza fragments and 20 or more medieval Hebrew manuscripts. Please always interpret it. This is medieval Hebrew manuscripts. You must specify it. You leave off the word medieval, point off. All right? Medieval Hebrew manuscripts. And then the Septuagint. That is a Gothic G standing for Greek. It has a superscript, MSS, which means multiple manuscripts. It just means more than one manuscript. It is superscript to Septuagint, so it's only talking about Septuagint manuscripts. So Septuagint manuscripts, plural, we don't know how many, but more than one. The Gothic S stands for Syriac. And the Gothic T, notice the little T here inside the rocker? It's not a backward seven. It is a T. That's how you tell this from this. That stands for the Aramaic Targums. Et, Latin for and. First Chronicles, chapter 6, verse 56. The comma is just like our colon. Ut is Latin for as. Q means curre. C Cha uh, Joshua chapter 20 verse 8 textual critical apparatus note B so in the one column you put this text in the next column you put all of this and in the third and final column going to the right as given to you in the, the uh, study notes you interpret write out what it means this all means the Cairo Geniza fragment, 20 or more medieval Hebrew manuscripts, Septuagint manuscripts, at least two, the Syriac Peshitta, the Targum, and 1 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 56 read as the Kare up here. All right? Compare Joshua chapter 20, verse 8, textual apparatus, note B. Now, what does that do to resolve the problem of the Kathiv Kare and whether the Kare is a correction of the text? Well, let's examine this for a minute. It says 20 or more medieval Hebrew manuscripts support that spelling to where it's changed to Golan with a wow after the Gimel. How many medieval manuscripts are there of the text of Joshua chapter uh, 21? You'd have to find that out. Because it may mean that it's a majority. It may mean that it's a minority. There are over 5,000 medieval Hebrew manuscripts. So the question is, how many of those manuscripts contain Joshua chapter 21 and this particular verse 27? Septuagint manuscripts. Well, let's think about that a minute. A Septuagint is a translation in the Greek. How would you spell it any differently in Greek because you took a different spelling in Hebrew? Take a look at that, those of you who have Greek, and you tell me how would you spell this word, this name, any differently whether you're referring to the Kathiv or the Kare? Absolutely no difference whatsoever. Same as in English. Therefore, that is not evidence that evidence is absolutely worthless. All it does 
is clutter up the textual critical apparatus, confuse the issue, and misrepresent the evidence. Syriac Peshitta. Syriac Peshitta translated starting about 100 AD, finished 400 AD. In Syriac, they normalized the spellings of proper names all the way through, no matter where you're at. Would it make any difference here? Absolutely none whatsoever. Zippo evidence to support. <laughs>